This is the 100X Podcast. If this is your first time listening, you know, you maybe you don't know what we like to do. What we want to do right now is we are sitting down with projects that maybe you haven't heard of yet to talk about why they make crypto and blockchain significantly more awesome. Um, we are sitting down with Gleb Sidorkin from Cellframe. Welcome, Gleb. Do you want to introduce Cellframe, what you guys are building, what you're bringing to the world of Web3 and why you're making it more awesome? Sure, yeah. Thank you for having me. Well, yeah, to pleasure. start out, yeah, to start out with Cellframe, you know, we are the first quantum proof blockchain in existence as far as we know. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we've uh, that, that's kind of one of the main draws for people that are coming in is that we, you know, we've back in 2017 when the project started, we already kind of were our, our founders were pre predicting the the quantum situation that has really kind of unfolded in the past uh, couple of years, really on the mainstream. Uh, Can you but, real quick? Before we dig into everything this episode has to offer, we want to highlight the awesome partners who sponsor this podcast and make it possible for us to work full-time on 100X. They're legends, and we appreciate them for supporting us. Let's talk about Reactor, a proof-of-work blockchain that introduces a brand new economic model, deep in mining software, a gaming distribution platform, the RKR token, and their game, Minions of Steel, that's proving their thesis by seamlessly integrating Proof of work token mining with gaming. Through allowing players to mine with their own GPU while playing, not only do they essentially make gaming free, they make software free and they present an AI proof income for everyone. If you want to take a glimpse into the future and get there early, explore Reactor's ecosystem at the link below. Crypto does not need to be complicated. Kadena is building the human layer of blockchain by giving the power back to the people and allowing them to build products that make a difference for humanity. Founded by ex-JP Morgan and SEC blockchain leads, Kadena develops easy to understand, human readable tools and solutions that focus on the long-term development of the space, not just short-term gains. Simply put, if we want real, regular people to enter and enjoy Web3, Kadena is making a way. To learn more, check out Kadena.io, follow them on Twitter at Kadena underscore IO, or watch our episode with them. Astrobit is the king of automated trading, and now they've introduced a freemium model. Put those trading fees to use. How does it work? Sign up to an exchange with one of Astrobit's affiliate links and receive at least 30 free credits as a loyalty bonus. Then earn credits on your trading fees. The more you trade, the more credits you can generate. Use those credits towards trading bots and strategies. In other words, you can create a passive income stream at no cost. Find more deets in the description below. Mm -hmm. If someone doesn't know what the quantum issue is, okay. that's an issue that's coming that anyone that like works in crypto knows about. But maybe if you're if you're newer to crypto, what is the uh, why does it matter that you guys are quantum proof? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the the, the quantum proof um, feature of self frame is part of a bigger package of kind of us being a high performance blockchain. But to break it down quickly with um, the quantum issues, so quantum computers, aside from just being super fast, have a even more special aptitude towards cracking encryption. Uh, <laughs> and so hypothetically, uh, a fairly, you know, the first serviceable uh, quantum supercomputer that, that could be put into into existence would immediately crack uh, classical encryption. And <clears throat> the two major kind of people that would be affected would be like governments who need to keep secrets, have a lot of encrypted data, and then blockchain. So as far as- so like uh, our kind of, solution of like, oh, this is the most secure way to, to do anything on the internet. That's actually not true as soon as quantum computing steps into the, into the picture. Exactly. So the minute that um, you're a viable quantum computer comes online, which could be any time, your Bitcoin wallet is no longer private. Your private key is no longer private. It can just be cracked. And, um, you know, governments and uh, obviously private business are looking ahead to this post quantum apocalypse situation where classical encryption um, that protects your Bitcoin wallet will just be useless and, and how to prepare for that. And so there have been a variety of uh, post-quantum encryption methods that have been created. There's a, you know, na a international agency that 
national U.S. has a major initiative to like have competitions and create these post quantum encryption styles. Um, but the problem is that they're all super uh, large file size. It's an orders of magnitude bigger than what would be uh, your your hash size for <clears throat> Bitcoin or Ethereum with classical encryption. So that leads to the the idea that um, we need a super high performance blockchain that would be able to handle the, that, those file sizes at, at a speed, right? And of course, first generation blockchains have a, a speed scalability issue as well. So as we were building, uh, you know, Cellframe is essentially a third generation blockchain, which solves those scalability issues the, uh, at a high performance level. And also we've built, and that allows us also to, to create these post quantum signatures. And another aspect of the post quantum that is built into the architecture of cell frame as a third, I would say almost fourth generation blockchain is uh, easy uh, upgradability. So with the quantum apocalypse looming, you know, Ethereum has this huge uh, amount of capital in it, huge amount of users. And um, Vitalik has said, all right, we're gonna do a hard fork for when the quantum apocalypse comes. Uh, well, that, that there's a lot. Of, it's not. It's much easier said than done. Uh, and so we, hard forks are obviously a whole process of their own. But then also, you need to. Your private key would have to change, and there would there, there would be like a gap there where you would have to kind of reveal your identity to to swap that out. Anyway, so the, all all the. Mm, well, that the, plus so like the, I mean, you talk about like you talk that other point that you're hitting on that, like not even just to become quantum proof, like any kind of upgrade in Ethereum, that's been a big critique from maybe like from the Solana side of things is every time Ethereum has to upgrade, there's no going back. Like if they, we had Quai Network on um, a couple months ago, if you're familiar with those guys. And um, one of their big pitches was like, dude, like a lot of, we've, we've been working on these things since the same time that Ethereum has, but we just felt like, dude, we, if you make a mistake with Ethereum, if there's, maybe not even a mistake, like you make a change with Ethereum and then you realize three years down the line, like, oh shoot, we actually need a different upgrade. There's no reversing those decisions. Um, it is not flexible <laughs> in any capacity. And so you guys are providing flexibility then is like your third point. Yeah, so there's like a, a system of decrees that, that allow upgrades to be sort of happen on the fly. <clears throat> That's something that the team actually just built in recently where we don't actually even have to pause the network at all to, to do upgrades. Um, so yeah, that's huge because we don't really know to prepare for the quantum apocalypse. We don't really know. <clears throat> One of the existing um, encryption methods could be cracked. Um, we now have wallets you can make with. You can use all the top the top three uh, post quantum encryptions all in multi in a multi signature wallet. <laughs> just if you want to be super safe about it. But you know, this is all going for the you know to preparing for the quantum apocalypse. But then also. The high performance aspect, um, it's sort of what you mentioned with the problems with first generation blockchain is that, yeah, we're kind of used to these, um, you know, because the network effects are so strong with something like Ethereum, we are kind of used to taking the performance hit that goes along with that. Like we're almost ha are used to there being a trade off between performance and decentralization. Yeah, and there's always a trade, at least now there's always been a trade. And so, so maybe there's not with you guys. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so that's, um, so part of the way that sort of we achieve a high, high performance on a machine level of, on a code level is that the code is written entirely in pure C. And I've noticed this is another kind of cell frame thing. That's now I think getting more prominent in the zeitgeist, um, <clears throat> people delivering, uh, code in C, it's, it runs much more quickly, much more efficiently than higher level languages. And it can, uh, it can orchestrate, or what's the word, uh, recruit all, all the, uh, all the power of your machine directly uh, as a low level language. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, so the performance aspects we are looking at, what we're looking at is making services that will hide and they don't necessarily need to foreground the fact that they're decentralized in order for people to use them. Um, <clears throat> you know, like I said, this trade-off, you know, we think of Bitcoin as like you have to be into the politics or into the, 
uh, you know, <clears throat> sovereign, it's sovereign money, it's sound money, you know, economics. Yeah, it's like the ideology is like first. With yeah, and the performance is like, well, it's slow, okay, right? But um, say something. So we have already our first kind of flagship service built on top of Self Frame is called Kel VPN, and it is it works better than any other VPN. the de The decentralization factor <clears throat> in computer networks is actually a plus. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be a drain on performance. Actually, it should ideally. Increased performance. Uh, one good example is a, a BitTorrent. So you can think of self frames based services as kind of BitTorrent, but incentivized with crypto, with micropayment. So BitTorrent can be like if you've ever down, downloaded something. Not that I you know condone piracy, but if you ever, you can sometimes. Can, yeah, I've, I've uh, never yeah. used BitTorrent. Uh, <laughs> If you're in crypto, man, at some point, I'm sure you've messed around with that world. <laughs> yeah. So you can, you sometimes will find just crazy download speeds on torrent. And maybe because you, because you're, um, you're pumping the file from your next door neighbor or something like that. And the, the there's no latency. Everything is, so decentralization can actually, uh, should be improving performance. Um, so yeah, that's what, so KelVPN, like other things that we're building actively on top of self frame, <clears throat> one of them was video conferencing. So right now we're, we're, you know, Riverside has big servers somewhere. They have to make sure that their servers are local enough globally for there to be good speed, right? Like it, serving video, you know, YouTube has. And even still, it's kind of mid, where's the crypto solution? to podcasting. There's like a million crypto podcasts. Yeah. And so I mean, any kind of file transfer, you know, up to now, it's been kind of a conventional wisdom that the blockchain is not fast enough of a network to, to do that kind of stuff like live serving live video. Uh, AI training is huge. I, I kind of I really would like to get into that aspect of things. But yeah, so I mean, a, a, a network uh, can be higher performance on the basis of it being decentralized in addition to the other benefits of decentralization, right? But as long as the performance is good, then you don't really have to convince people of the politics. It's just running in the background. So we've got VPN, um, you know, something like video conferencing, if it, uh, so the, yeah, the kind of high performance C code allows us to do that much faster than previously thought possible in a blockchain setting. So you're able to be significantly quicker. Is there a trade? I mean, we've we've been talking about like we mentioned trade offs a couple times, right? Like Ethereum's whole thing is like, hey, the trade off is that we're a little slower and a little more expensive, but we'll solve that. Solana's is, hey, we're faster than Ethereum, but the trade off is we're a little bit less secure and a little bit less decentralized. Is there a trade off for you guys? <clears throat> Once you get up to scale, then there isn't a trade off. You you just get all the benefits of decentralization plus high performance. The challenge is getting to the scale uh, because the <clears throat> the quality of the service is what attracts the users, but then the size of the network is what allows for high quality service, right? So we need a lot of people getting into, you know, our say our conference call. Right, it's a chicken and egg scenario. A little bit, yeah. So that's that's when you that's where we're pushing at the beginning. You need <clears throat> you need buy in from communities, which you know I think it, it's, it's very possible because of that early adopter incentive of people who do appreciate decentralization on its own merits um, you know, for, all, for all the other reasons. So we talked about a little bit of how the Gen 1 blockchains have inherent issues that we've all seen happen in this space, but also we talked about the quantum apocalypse. How does this VPN service or even the video conferencing service help in that quantum apocalypse or how are the two connected and how is self frame going to be one of those solutions to stop the quantum apocalypse from affecting the blockchain that we know today? How are they connected? Yeah. Um, I mean, it all goes back to the high performance aspect, right? So the basically self frame is, you know, we have high ambitions uh, to be a, a, the preeminent place where people will go to build uh, blockchain based services. And the, so the quantum apocalypse, anyone who builds on top of self frame will automatically get that security of, of the quantum proof blockchain. Um, and then as far as creating all the services, yeah. So when you're building it, it, you get, you get the quantum proof, you get the high performance of the C code, right? All, all the code is delivered fresh and C up, uh, 
in-house, you know, that's also ties into security where a lot of exploits have come out through um, teams using third-party code. So we're basically, you know, we're, co we're competing with Ethereum on a level of we started building from scratch and in a very rigorous way, <clears throat> a code base that's going to be, that's going to withstand the quantum apocalypse, that's going to withstand the needs of, of high volume of uh, scale of scale and everything like that. So we, yeah, we think we can make better services. We can provide better security in the long term, and that and that is why we're a platform that's going to be attractive uh, to people to build on. Okay, just so, so just to make sure that I understood everything that we just mentioned, you're seeing that hey, the quantum apocalypse is coming, and anyone who understands what that means also agrees that it's coming. I mean, you talked about how Vitalik is also thinking about hard forking Ethereum, but some of the issues that may come with that. You're saying, hey, Cellframe is bringing a solution that can avoid all those problems from the get-go because you built with that sort of quantum problem from the very beginning. You call that stable stakes, table stakes. You're saying, you know what, we're gonna fix that from the very get-go. And on top of that, you're also building all these other services that can help people build in this ecosystem that maybe some of the other blockchains like Ethereum and Bitcoin don't already have. Is that is that sort of what I'm understanding? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, I do have one question to build on top of that, though. With with that idea in mind of like, hey, we're having those issues solved from the get go. How? Why would someone choose to build on Cell Frame? And if they do decide to build on Cell Frame, is there ways that they can communicate with other ecosystems like Ethereum or like blockchain? We're seeing that that's another big way or another huge way that people are starting to move because interoperability is really becoming the new way. We don't want any more fragmentation in the space. We want to be able to communicate with everyone, you know, at the end of the day. Is Cell Frame also going in that direction? Definitely, yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of built into a lot of third generation blockchains. If you look at something like we, you know, something that's really famous, uh, Polkadot. Uh, so we have a similar interoperability layer structure. Um, yeah, but ultimately, with Ethereum, it's it's a hard it's a hard subject to go around with the, the quantum apocalypse thing because I mean I I like Ethe I love Ethereum and Bitcoin, um, but the, you know we had a, uh, someone who wanted to partner with us recently and he was just like crazy about the idea that we're going to save Bitcoin using cell frame technology. <clears throat> In a way, that's possible, but it, but it would involve um, people actually coming into, into the Silk Frame ecosystem, so porting the Bitcoin over, uh, because the in order to get that protection of the post quantum signatures, so that's actually possible. Uh, we could easily, you know, bridge <laughs> the entirety of Bitcoin into the Silk Frame ecosystem one for one, and you wouldn't need to, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't need to do a hard fork like uh, you could just do that. Um, so in, ter in terms of the legacy um, <clears throat> networks, yes, there's a, there's an interoperability layer that's you know kind of built into it. But in terms of the quantum proofing of those legacy, um, uh, those legacy blockchains, it's a little more difficult. And you know, I think so. You can essentially the solution is, hey, if you want to be quantum proof, you <laughs> enter our ecosystem, not the other way around. How would you? I mean, but so like tech wise, um, if you can solve that like on a technicality level, awesome. Like you guys are quantum proof, but, but, and this is not to like throw shade at you. Um, there has been, it feels like the last few years was, Hey, is anyone going to compete with Bitcoin? Okay. Yep. Ethereum's competing with Bitcoin. Okay. Is anyone going to compete with Ethereum? Well, Solana, well, AVAX, well, Polygon, uh, Polka start like the other layer ones that we're trying to compete. Okay. Well, Ethereum's kind of cemented itself now. Now it's like those layer twos are competing with Ethereum's layer twos and layer threes and ZK rollups. Um, and it is a large world of everyone trying to say, hey, we are the best blockchain to build on. Please come build over here. How do you guys actually, like if you are the best, if you are the only quantum proof one, how do you actually get those developers? Because in my mind, it's less about getting users to come over and it's about getting developers to come build cool things over there. And right now it feels like, I mean, Caesar and I have complained about this on the show before that like we'll run into something really cool that we're like, dude, this is so sweet why in the world are you building on Ethereum like directly? Why don't you go build on Arbitrum if you like Ethereum's ecosystem so it doesn't cost me a million dollars to like use your cool dApp? Um, and it feels like so many developers still prioritize just going where the liquidity is and that is Ethereum right now um, versus going 
to the spot that would actually be best for them on a technicality level. So how do you get those developers to choose to go to the place that would actually be best for what they're building outside of liquidity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think there's two parts to that question. One, you know, how, you know, how is it possible to leapfrog uh, Ethereum? Uh, and I think the answer is yes, if capital and, and uh, talent can move rather quickly, um, I, I'm old enough to have remember a time when the <clears throat> the most popular search engine in the world was Alta Vista, and it, it had the best algorithm. <clears throat> and a little company. That's awesome because that is that predates <laughs> me. I've heard that before. Never <laughs> used it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think Google was the top when I started using the internet, but I don't remember what I was using. You probably, I, I mean, anything Google, and everything, whatever was on the computer that I opened. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so Google very quickly destroyed uh, some of the other major search engines yeah. when they showed how fast and good their algorithm was. Um, so, you know, it does uh, ultimately the engineers can see like a more efficient code. And then also we, as a, you know, as a team, we have to obviously nurture that. Um, part of it is the self frame SDK uh, software development kit is extremely, it's kind of the core of, of the, of the company in some ways. So I think, you know, teams that do come on, um, we've had one third so far, we have like KelvyPN, which was built. The team kind of grew up in house. Um, but then we have node sys, which are uh, coming online and they're a third party team that's bringing on. But I think the more engineers see the, what kind of code we've, we've delivered uh, in our SDK and the, the design of the network, they will be drawn to it for sure. Uh, we just need to get the word out there at this point and um, build, build our network up. I mean, right now we're still less than a year into the launch of the mainnet and we've got, we're still working on the bi-directional bridge. So, but yeah, I think the, you know, the performance just uh, has to speak for itself in the end. Yeah. Prove the tech. I mean, and then the the piece there, just the follow up on that. You mentioned like, okay, like we we've got to prove the tech because then we can actually have the evidence to say, hey, we're the best. And you guys are in the year one of saying, look, like we are proving our white paper to be true. We're proving the ideas to be a reality. Um, but then comes like the the marketing essentially. Who was it? I think we had um, Rex. His name's Josh something. Uh, Rex from BattleTech. Um, and a few other cool companies own GG, if you know who that is. Um, he, he said something the other day in an episode that we did with them where he said, um, that he said, there are graveyards full of the best tech because they sold themselves to the wrong audiences, something along the lines. Um, and I'm curious, like, what do you guys, is there a, a method that, that you guys have that says, Hey, this is how we're going to make sure that the best tech gets in front of the right eyes. Are you going like the VC route? Are you going the straight to developers? Are you going, are you tackling specific sectors? I know you've mentioned uh, like streaming, video streaming when no one's really doing that. So that's like one outlet that you guys could, could like corner that market. Are there specific ways that you're like, Hey, these are the audiences we want to get in front of first. So the world can see the tech we're building. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, obviously when you're starting out, actually the, the, the coin has been around for a long time. So we've kind of been, slowly broadening our community of investors. Um, and now with the main net, like you said, uh, the re reaching developers is key. Uh, you know, one, one thing I, I like about so a, a little bit of a science background uh, in Siberia. Um, so we, they recently did a, they worked with the local university to do um, a global hackathon competition for cryptography. Uh, so, you know, people, people are fascinated with the idea of cryptography, people who are fascinated with the idea of, um, of quantum computing, uh, of blockchain, of decentralization, you know, because we are like a hardcore decentralized platform, right? I mean, people who are drawn to that uh, aspect of it whether, for various reasons, whether from purely technological or uh, other reasons. So I think, um, you know, we're definitely all about organic growth, getting the right people to come and join. The best PR is going to be our community uh, and our performance. 
Cool. Rad, man. I have, I have just, I was thinking as you were answering that, there was an, a note, I was scrolling through your white paper. There was a note that I, I read earlier. Um, and I'm curious how this correlates with like the way that I've been presenting you guys is direct competition with Ethereum or direct competition with some of these other layer ones. Um, there's a quote in your guys' white paper that says, self frame is not just a blockchain protocol. We call it an infrastructure layer for building a blockchain ecosystem. All existing blockchain solutions can be transferred to self frame and get previously unattainable performance and security levels. Would you, would you guys view yourselves as like, is that just me framing it that way? Self frame framing it that way. Um, that like you're competing with Ethereum or is, do you view Ethereum and the other layer ones as like your competition? Are you competing on something else entirely? Do you have a desire? for those blockchain solutions to be transferred to self frame and have their performance and security boosted? Like, what does that look like vision wise for you guys? Cause maybe even framing you guys as competitors, um, isn't the way that you guys are positioning it. And that's just my own bias. I mean, I think ultimately, yes, uh, they, they are our competitors ultimately. Mm. Okay. And in terms of like making every other blockchain, a parachain of self frame, and it being the infrastructure that's going to encompass all the existing ones, that's also a possible future and, you know, possibly likely given the reality of the quantum apocalypse. But I think on a more near to medium term level, the service aspect uh, of cell frame can really shine, especially in this moment that we're having right now with AI uh, computing being such a, a hot topic. Um, so. You know, for example, like if you know, Bitcoin kind of a, has kind of emerged more or less as a store of value more than anything else, you know, with all the all the money coming into it now. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. Gold. The digital gold aspect of it. <clears throat> and, you know, quantum security aside, we can leave that to Bitcoin and focus on services. <clears throat> like I said, the, 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 the quality of the services themselves will speak for themselves and Kind of not, I see that as a niche, and it's not even a niche because it's a vast industry, right? I mean, you, you take financial services, yeah. right? But then you take computing services, cloud computing, cloud storage. Those are billion, many billions of dollars uh, worth of industries. <clears throat> and right now with the AI thing, right, we have people realizing that centralization, what's, what we like about centralization for money we are also going to like that about decentralization. I, I made a misspoke. What we like about decentralization for money, we are also going to like about decentralization for AI training and running, right? So if, um, a cell frame has a special architecture for its dApps. We call them T-dApps, true dApps. So they, they don't have a single okay. smart contract owner. It runs as a plugin on the network, and it's more or less once you once you launch it, it's just supported by the participants and not by single. And so people can understand why that's unique. What is, so it, most other dApps, how is that different from the way most chains are, are running dApps? So any other, most other traditional dApp, you would have a, a smart contract, uh, which that smart contract could. That somebody else had to write. Yeah. Someone wrote it and someone owns, owns it and holds the key to it. Um, so <laughs> even though the, software, the architecture of it is decentralized. There's still an element of centralization in the fact that it's the smart contract is held by a specific owner. So our, our decentralized uh, services don't have that aspect. So with, um, with AI, so yeah, so we're, we're seeing like more and more people want to have control over <clears throat> their data, even their compute, right? We, it's the centralized entities building Chad GPT. Okay, we love them. They, they built a great product, but then they're actually like putting the brakes on their own product. There's censorship issues involved. Um, so an AI that would be- too Claims good. of them being nefarious, depending on which side you subscribe to on Twitter, because it's centralized at the end of the day. A human being is in control of it, yeah. Yeah, and so what we what we like I said what we learned about centralized money applies to say AI, and we uh, that's cool. We, uh, I saw on Twitter uh, I forget a guy named Satoshi something. His project is called um, 
lots of truffles. That's a funny name. Uh, but they're building basically small supercomputers for, for your house to run AI locally in your okay yourself, right? And, and his <clears throat> catchphrase was like, you know, with with Bitcoin, it was not your keys, not your money. With AI, it's not not your compute, not your AI. And man, that is like I'm watching. Uh, I just started the Fallout show, and I don't know if you ever played the Fallout games, but I I loved those games. Um, I loved the Fallout games and they all had like their, what was it called? Their personal robot that they had. We're like, uh, no spoilers, please. We're, so no show comments, but they like all had their own personal robots in the, in the game, um, in that universe. That's kind of the world that we're entering right now. Your own little personal AI. Yeah. And you guys are, you got your system, the cell frame system, the same way that Bitcoin could decentralize gold. Um, if you believe the Ethereum like ultrasound money meme that like they could decentralize money, cell frame has the capacity and the structure to decentralize the way that we train artificial intelligence. Yeah. And ownership, you know, one of the beautiful things about decentralization, ownership structures, right, can be various. You can have you and a thousand of your friends can all get together and train an AI. <clears throat> you know, the blockchain keeps track of who's doing how much work. Uh who has uh, the side of the stake that you might have in, in, in this AI that you're building communally. Um, you know, you could have a, a small team um, who doesn't have the resources to, to spin up uh, all the necessary servers. They can just you do micropayments across a, a cell frame network to get their computing resources that they need. You know, so yeah, everything. Um, the Are you guys what, I, I, at I just cell frame? So, so, oh, go ahead, sorry. This, you, you know, you were mentioning how you guys got into this just as investors. Um, yeah. And but that's important, too, because the beauty of blockchain is it it gets rid of gatekeepers in investing in tech. Right. So you have people. Yep. Smart people. Right. I never would have been able to ever invest in tech if it if crypto and blockchain did not exist. Yeah. So, I mean, the decentralization, you know, it's powerful in that financial way. And so an ownership of ownership of uh, you know stocks, you know obviously we're not a security, but ownership in uh, tech companies for individual investors, you know same kind of deal with AI. O ownership of uh, small teams being able to get clear the barrier of entry to make an AI project. People <clears throat> having made, you know maybe the soon AI uh, ChatGPT can be outcompeted by a DAO. Which runs, uh, you know, on millions of you know, th thousands of thousands of computers around the world, are running this uh, training, this algorithm, and it's co-owned by everyone participating in it. And it could be and okay, this, potentially faster. Yeah, that's sick. This piece is really cool to me because of a couple of reasons, right? You mentioned the fact that I'm an investor. So, like, as a re retail, I don't know how I would class myself crypto native. I think there's like a gap between like you got institutional investing on one side and you got retail on the other. And that's where normies, normal people like me used to be. But now there's like, well, I'm not really retail when it comes to crypto. They're probably not even here yet. Um, so I don't know. We're somewhere in the middle. But if you're an investor like me, like I'm constantly just following narratives of or maybe less following narratives and looking for what are the, the upcoming narratives going to be? Where should I invest on things that are going to matter in a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? I um, mean, you guys are essentially tapping into two of those narratives that are going to matter. One is quantum proof computing. Um, and the other is AI that's actually decentralized. There is, can you break down um, like why, why AI should be, like what would the argument be that AI should be decentralized? Why is it an issue that open AI is not decentralized or open for that matter? They're a, they're a closed for-profit company now, even though their name is open AI. Um, but why is it an issue that it's not decentralized and what, what kind of cool opportunity besides maybe, hey, it could be faster because there's more input going in, does decentralization offer artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Let me just go back to something you said, the first part of the question, and then I'll get into AI and decentralized. Um, kind of another narrative that's interesting is hardware and kind of the democratization of it. So at the same time that you know, OpenAI is building a trillion dollar computer in uh, in the desert. Uh, we also have 
<clears throat> for example, Bitcoin promoted this this, this huge production of uh, Bitcoin Ethereum mining of like these miner rigs. Um, so we have in people's homes and stuff a lot of actually made big computing power. Yeah, decentralized computing. Yeah, <clears throat> and now that you know, say Ethereum moved to uh, proof of stake, which is what Cell is on. Also, we have all these proof of work machines, but we those are actually you know, essentially video cards, so we can get people to plug those into a video conferencing system, right? So the hardware that's in people's homes, and we have Node Sys, which is a, our newest kind of parachain partner project. They are going to be building a distributed factory. So people being able to spin up distributed computer networks, that, that hardware aspect of it is growing and growing. Um, and as, as far as centralization of AI, I mean, it. yeah, I think... You know, after having this argument, um, my <laughs> my dad recently, he's an administrator at a university in California, and he recently became the AI czar of this institution. Not that he has deep experience in it, but it's such a hot topic for education and for everything. And I, I feel like, you know, then there's this whole decelerationist, accelerationist argument. And I think, you know, he, he's on the kind of not on the decelerationist side, but, you know, we, we, he basically trusts open AI to do a great job and the centralization of it will make it more effective, right? They have all the money, they collect all the money uh, and they, they can get all the, all the hardware. Uh, but, you know, I think people looking at it from the outside start to see, well, maybe I don't like the fact that uh, it's controlled by this political group within OpenAI, right? There, there's, um, you know, they're always having to respond to some political pressure. They're actual, are, are they, and I think it's actually interesting because it used to be that, like say with operating systems, you had Linux would come out and make like a viable operating system and a few nerds would use it. But then Windows would come out and it would like be much, it would be easier to use. It has all the support, it has all those, that backing. So it would actually be higher performance in a lot of ways. But now if an, if an uh, open source AI, which self is all o open source and <clears throat> if an open source AI can actually outcompete uh, Chad GPT on the level of performance, because ChatGPT is actually hamstrung its own performance for political reasons. So that would be one thing, right? If, um, you know, so the, I, I think there's obviously the centralized players are always going to have their say. <clears throat> but I think now more and more we're seeing, um, because, you know, people just, I don't know, people like the idea. I mean, there's in that piece too, there's the like, I mean, in that piece, speaking on the like the political side of things, what is Google's AI called again? I forget, but there's, I mean, there's got so much heat for like, it was like clearly very biased to one side of the American political spectrum, um, which is it's way smaller than even like the worldwide politics, but it was like very clearly built by a small group of people with the exact same ideology in life. And it was unwilling to communicate or even engage with, with people that would ask it questions that fit outside of that, like political philosophy. And that was like way more specific with Google's than it was with open AIs. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, it's just that idea of like, Hey, if a small group of people are building it, if it's not done correctly, or maybe that is the way they wanted it to be done. I don't know. I mean, if it's not done correctly, or if it's done really just a small group of people, it's going to reflect the people that are building that AI. Um, and if it's then that would, that would come into play too, with the centralization. With ownership of data is another issue. I mean, we have, <clears throat> you know, we we have we had that happen with uh, social networks where we're we're just forking our data over to Facebook, Meta Corporation, just making bank off of us. Yeah, yeah, and the, and so I maybe I want to be the owner of my data. Uh, maybe I want to benefit uh, personally from, you know, <clears throat> we have this kind of trade off where. Um, <clears throat> we give our data to Facebook and they build us a, a free, free software. And we've had this trade off for decades now uh, in terms of big centralized companies. But I think we're, we're finding cracks in, in that, um, that trade off where the, the, the kind of 
<clears throat> distributed autonomous organization kind of model it has a lot of different uh, avenues to explore uh, as far as ownership of the data and um, autonomy and Right. So maybe now instead of them owning my data and, and basically trading my information for access to free resources, now maybe instead I can trade like my computing resources of the computer that I'm engaging um, with that stuff on it. Just And that's where your guys is, I mean, you tapped in. I don't know how deep into like decentralized computing you guys are going at, at CellFrame, but I don't know. Like we've talked to the handful of those um, brands that are working in decentralized computing. And I think that itself is fascinating. I had... Caesar, did you have a question uh, before I, on the AI topic before I asked a different one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On this AI topic, because you did bring an interesting sort of analogy between sort of like what happened with Linux and then Microsoft. With the AI sort of scenario, how do you avoid that same issue happening? How do you avoid that your AI, even though it's decentralized and has better features, at, at the core is a better AI model than OpenAI or Google's? How do you avoid that same pitfall that Linux has been having with Windows that it's only used by a small subset of people and never never really sees the mass adoption as you would like to see it? Right. How do you be Windows and not Linux? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I think we've – I wrote like an article on Twitter recently that now we're, that we're finally seeing an opportunity for <clears throat> open source to make, make a splash, right? Because you, you have like Mistral – is a uh, open source AI project. I think they're out of France. Um, and yeah, because Ch even though Chad GPT has all the money and kind of the head start, they're also hamstringing their own performance uh, for, for political reasons, right? So that's an opportunity to catch up. Uh, but then, like I said, you know, with the, the capability of a decentralized system actually has a higher ultimately a high, very high ceiling for performance. Um, if we really do have, you know, get scale on a <clears throat> decentralized training, you know, and you can get that scale because people have the incentive to, to buy in because uh, they're actually getting feedback. They're getting either ownership or passive income coming in. Um, so we can get, if we get the scale, we get the incentives right, we get the scale then it will be impossible for a centralized entity to to beat us, right? Uh, at that point, depending on the scale that, that we can achieve. Um, so yeah, I think with with the, like I said, with the hardware kind of just distributed hardware coming up, uh, with centralized uh, software kind of showing it cracks, showing its weaknesses. Those two things can 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 combine to just ultimately out competing them, um, because yeah, I think I don't know it, it, the ownership uh, part will is con is a bit more conceptual. People do like with Bitcoin, it is it is a very attractive <clears throat> kind of almost psychological human tendency. We want we want that ownership. We we don't want to be have our kind of something that's important to us be reliant on arbitrary decisions. And some people that, that we're not, um, you know, taxation without representation kind of thing. Uh, so there's there's that 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 draws people in, but that you know passive income is also an extremely powerful, uh, m m even easier to understand incentive, right? So when I say like I came into crypto initially, the thing that brought me to Web three was specifically passive income. Like that's how I got here years ago, and I think. So many people with an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial mindset, like that's why they showed up here as well. Where is the next wave of money? And maybe it's here. Um, I have a totally like maybe out of left field question, but you've referenced a few times like video conferencing. Um, and one thing that I've wanted to see happen that can actually like when I say happen, I mean exist on chain that has not yet, as far as I've seen, been done at all or done well, maybe. Um, is like live streaming a video. Um, like a, we talk about like the replace, we talk about like web three's ability to replace web two things like open AI. Um, one thing we haven't seen get replaced is YouTube. I've seen, I know of one protocol that's trying to do it, um, but I don't know like their level of decentralization. decentralization. I've never talked in depth with them. Um, but then I think about like, we're pretty heavily in the gaming space. I would say, again, that's like a narrative we follow really heavily. It's 
it's really hard for me to imagine another sector of crypto that can bring like mass adoption to the same degree that gaming could simply because uh, you don't have to teach gamers anything about blockchain. You just have to get them to play the game. And if the blockchain is operating in the back end, boom, you added a million users via one game. Um, obviously that's like theoretical, but I'm pretty bullish on like the gaming sector because of that. But there is no like decentralized replacement of Twitch. There's no decentralized replacement of um, YouTube. There's no decentralized replacement of, and that's a huge industry. That's like, that's, that's producing billions of dollars constantly, every single year, just video streaming. And that's something that, that Web3, to my knowledge, has not tackled. Part of it being the fact that, that you hit earlier with like the way you guys are wanting to tackle video conferencing. Dude, it's like, that's so difficult to do on chain. Is what you guys are building at Cellframe, could this theoretically be accomplished here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> I, I know what you're saying. I mean, it, it, it is like a daunting challenge moving all that data. Uh, but yeah, I mean. Yeah, because it's just constant, like it's a rapid flow and it has to be able to ma be maintained live. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, with, with a, you know, a Cellframe network, <clears throat> the, the kind of, the architecture of our, uh, you know, the sharding is you know, at a very advanced level to the point where it's limited your speed on the network. It would just be limited by your con connectivity. And so if you have a huge distributed network of computers with fast internet, um, <clears throat> you can break down easily each job, right? So one computer will kind of creating the, the map where the video, the, the data needs to go, balancing the flows. So when you just put, if you incentivize enough people to, to to plug into that, you can make an extremely high high performance network. But you need that efficient code and the, and the high throughput capacity uh, of a network like Cellframe. But yeah, I think um, you know I think we're, we're, we're people have been skeptical that we can deliver uh, you know like a super high performance video thing because video, video files are so heavy. But uh, we, we're pretty confident that we can do that uh, once the network. Could we, see like, could we see like video NFTs become a thing at that point? Um, because I know like with, that's another left field question. I'm just thinking about like use cases. Maybe the reason I'm thinking about these questions is a lot of times I, I wonder, like, I don't remember who we talked to. We talked to someone one time when, when Caesar asked him like, uh, hey, like, what, what kind of use cases do you see this unlocking? And he was like, dude, I don't know. Like, it's hard to imagine things you've never experienced before. Um, and I think I'm trying to wrap my head around like, hmm, what, what evolutions of the current Web3 could we see come to fruition if you guys are successful? Um, and again, that's another thing that like the average NFT is like, they barely store anything, actual data on the chain. Like the image is not stored on chain. That's, that's too difficult. That's too expensive. It's whatever. Um, they're just storing like the, the digits or the numbers. Um, to store actual video, that's like, again, that, that is a hurdle to jump over. Um, but yeah. maybe we see like and that, and that has, in 2026, the, the evolution of NFTs is video. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, the, that, that has to do with kind of our ability to recruit the resources of, 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 yeah. the, compute, of the nodes in the network. Um, yeah, and in terms of like... It, you know, like I said, uh, w w with video, someone has a bunch of Ethereum rigs that they can plug in, and it's an extremely powerful uh, tool. But with ga actually, I want to go back. You said with gaming, I was thinking about gaming actually yeah. this morning. Is I mean, isn't there? Don't gamers have some of the same gripes about centralization, like um, <clears throat> where the the powers that be you would think they would love take your stuff or something. Yeah. Yeah. You would think they would love crypto because the centralization side of like Ubisoft, that, that's a good example of one that is kind of dunking on everyone right now. Um, I think about like, I don't know if you ever played Call of Duty, but I think about when Warzone 1 was like, hey, we're turning off our servers. Everyone that spent tons of money on skins, thankfully I hadn't, but everyone that had spent tons of money on these digital skins, they're gone. Oh, but next week we'll turn on our servers for Warzone 2, which is exactly the same thing. Like oh. the code is literally identical, but your skins don't exist anymore. Come buy some new ones. Like, why would you not want to have that be a digital asset that you own? Crazy. Yeah, see, I think that's, you know, we're getting into more of the disadvantages of centralized systems. It's like maybe they can be beholden or maybe they can just do money grabs that are completely piss off their users. And yeah, I mean, so you could see a, a distributed autonomous organization 
running a game, right? So where the players actually have ownership, uh, an ownership stake in it, or, um, you know, I think that, that would be attractive at some point to users. And then as long as the performance is there, then... I have, I have yeah. another quick question, and this goes back to the idea of what Cell Frame's trying to do at the very core of sort of making sure that you guys avoid the quant, uh, the quantum apocalypse. But you, you do, you did bring a, a like a good point in that, like, hey, at the very beginning, you said that, hey, Ethereum has been thinking about, like, hey, how can we solve, or how can we avoid the quantum apocalypse ourselves? And one of the ideas was a hard fork. Say down the road, you have Bit, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other blockchains coming to Cell Frame and saying, hey. We're actually taking this more seriously now. We want to go ahead and solve it. Do you think that there's a way or a world where cell frame would actually help these other L1s and other ecosystems become quantum proof in exchange, whether that be like, hey, it's cell frames technology is now implemented into all these blockchains? Because there is there is a reality that building a whole ecosystem and, and convincing a lot of developers and people who are just chasing liquidity, who are chasing the place where users currently are, to actually jump ship and go build a new into a new ecosystem that hasn't been really proven, that hasn't been around for as long as like Bitcoin and Ethereum, that's a big battle to have. But if you can now then help instead help these other L1s and chains really become quantum proof and just have all your technology embedded and you can really see the, the the fruits of everything that you've been doing in everywhere at once, do you think that could be a possibility down the road? For sure. Um, I mean, you know, we see just decentralization as a movement and all the code you know, cell frame code is open source. Uh, you know, if anyone wants to learn from it or, you know, use it uh, to upgrade their own systems, right? That's all the better. <clears throat> we, you know, that's what, one of the cool things about building a project like this is that kind of we are for the movement. We, we like the benefits that decentralization brings to all kinds of things that we've been talking about. Um, but ultimately, the... You know they've been work. You know they've been um, building this code base for, you know, 2017. I think is the official start date for Cell Frame as a project. Um, but the kind of code exp expertise <clears throat> Dimitri has been building up that team um, for longer than that. I think you know, going back to like the early 2010s. So, yeah, you know, as far as like the ideas, you know, the whole idea of a upgrade that has enough performance to be to support quantum signatures, you know, that's available. <clears throat> People can try to do it. But uh, the, the value that cell frame offers is in the what we've built so far, the code base that, that we've achieved and, and the design, the architecture of it. Um, the initial design is important, you know, however however you want to swing it, uh, ultimately the idea and the, the architecture that goes at the base of things is important. So we do have an edge in that, but if, you know, we, we, we don't want the, some thief to go take all of Bitcoin. Uh, so whatever, whatever needs to happen for Bitcoin to, uh, to, to save itself from that eventuality should happen. So to summarize that, cell frame deserves to stand on its own two legs with what you guys have built as a solution to quantum proof computing in the blockchain ecosystem. But should other layer ones want to utilize the tech that you guys have built, it's open source and they're free to do that. And you guys could end up being the solution for multiple ecosystems and not just. Yeah. Two. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, exactly. But it's a question of what, what is the optimal path? Do you uh, fix up you the guys, old yeah. thing or do you, Go with the thing that was designed from the start Create to work one. the way you, you, you want it to work. Um, <clears throat> that's essentially. And you guys aren't the first, to be clear, like you guys, we're not dogging you for that. Like you guys are not the first people that, I, that I've talked to that I've said, dude, that you like, you genuinely built something really impressive. I don't know if you, if you nerd out over this stuff, like I do, you would probably really be uh, intrigued by what the guys at Quai Network are building. And I mentioned him before, like they had a very similar answer of like, yeah, dude, like, we do believe that we're better. Um, and we waited because we didn't want to make the same mistakes that we believe they made early on. And that's like, wow, bold statement. But hey, maybe the first mover, and this is historically accurate, the first mover is not always the winner. I think, who is it? Uh, the, there's a book called Good to Great. I don't know if you've ever read it. Um, it was from like the 90s where they studied um, like the top, I forget. There was like a, a very specific parameter they used to find like the very best 
corporations, companies inside of um, the S&P 500, I think it was. Um, and they studied like how they got from a good company to a great company. And there it was something like 90% were the third or fourth or fifth or 10th mover. Almost none were the first mover. The first mover did not win when it was in the, the race to greatness. They paved the way for other guys to be inspired and then build to greatness. But almost never does the first mover be the one that like at the end, when it's all said and done, they settled into greatness. Almost never happened. So is it possible that Bitcoin wins or, or our Ethereum at that point? Is Ethereum the first mover of their ultrasound money ecosystem? Sure, man. Um, but statistically speaking, it's usually the third guy or the fourth guy or the fifth guy that was around long enough to build while they were having to make public mistakes. I mean, I got, you can't hardly see it right here, but Theodore Roosevelt's like, man in the arena, like don't critique me if you're not in the arena. And so it's not like negative criticism to throw at Bitcoin or Ethereum or anyone else that's been building. Um, but that's the reality. Like the, a lot of times. The, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's a little different. To achieve yeah, that. it's a good point. It's a little different than because of the community aspect. You know, like there wasn't like a, yeah. a Yahoo community when Google like defeated Yahoo. For sure. <laughs> it's like, oh, we love Yahoo. But, uh, um, but yeah, I think, you know. <laughs> <laughs> The Google fan base, the Google Discord where everyone's hanging out in. <laughs> and that's great. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, ultimately people, you know, we are still looking, you know, we are still sort of in the pre-mass adoption era. And when we look towards mass adoption, For sure. we don't know what the, the landscape is going to look like. Um, but I think, I think when certain services come online, you know, the first first service that doesn't, that's blockchain based, but doesn't have to advertise as itself as being blockchain based um will be interesting one. and kel vpn is like that a little bit uh, where we have users cool that's dope i have i really only have one more like question topic i don't know how deep you want to get but we have not referenced the cell token at all what is the only thing actually that's not true we referenced you said it's not a security i think that's the only statement we made about it this whole episode um what is the cell token used for in your guys' ecosystem? What is the purpose of it? I mean, it's the same as like ETH uh, for Ethereum, for the Ethereum network. It's, um, it, it has the, the primary token for the backbone network. It uh, collecting fees, the node validation, uh, all that stuff. And then other, uh, the interoperability layer and then other tokens can come in as uh, as parachains. You guys have mentioned, I know this is maybe like a different direction than if someone was to ask you questions about tokens and normal. I'm just curious, because you mentioned like you've been mainnet for a year now. Do you know even roughly like the um, like total unique wallets of sell? I'm just curious, like how many, how large the community of sell is? I can see the market cap of your token is like 24 million. So you guys are still relatively unknown if we want to dive into that direction. But I'm curious, like, is that, what does your community <clears throat> look like in regards to the token? As far as people who are already operating nodes, it's not a huge number at this point. Um, I actually don't have it off the top of my head. I, I think it would probably be in the hundreds. Um, but the... Okay. Yeah. The actual token itself, it... it you know, it's it's very distributed among like a community of small investors. So <clears throat> we don't have like giant whales that came in at the beginning who still control large chunks of it. <clears throat> it's very distributed. Um, yeah, just among holders. Uh, it's all all circulating uh, and all pretty much uh, in the hands of, of investors and in the community. Cool, dope, easy. Yeah. Easy. Um, the, the token stuff can be found. I was just reading, if anyone's curious, um, we'll have your guys' website down here, uh, wherever you're listening, there'll be a link somewhere um, where you can find just details about the white paper that I referenced about where to find you guys. I'm curious if someone is interested. So outside of, obviously, like I, I asked token stuff because that's who I am. But if someone's interested, maybe they're a developer or they're really interested in the AI stuff we were talking about. Um, what would be whatever the reason, like the best place to connect with or join you reference communities, right? Communities are one of the largest things that make crypto a little bit different than the traditional web two world. Um, where is like the best place to join the cell frame community? 
Uh, <clears throat> our Telegram is a good place to start. Uh, we have our official Telegram page. We have our support page uh, channel on Telegram. It's an unofficial trading channel that's pretty lively. Uh, I like hanging out there. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Twitter, social networks, we're, we've been using Instagram a bit to kind of show behind the scenes try to do stuff with the team um like we have kind of an international team but we do have a big office located in siberia in the <clears throat> what's known as the silicon silicon forest of russia the, the, the silicon forest instead of the silicon valley that's cool i i mean i've never heard of that but i did tell you before we started recording there anytime we're talking to this is like i don't know maybe living over there, that's the norm. But anytime I'm talking to someone that is like building a scaling solution or ZK rollups, or even I think two game studios now we've talked to, that it's like the people building really cool stuff, it is random that somehow half the team is Russian or Ukrainian or Eastern European. There is like a, something about everyone over there is like, these are geniuses or something. Yeah, no, I mean, it is, it's an, we have an interesting team for sure. And like, I, I was born in Siberia then moved, spent most of my life yeah. in America. And then I spent the last six years back in Russia. And I've been, <clears throat> the team is really interesting. Yeah, it's, there's a lot, you know, the Soviet kind of uh, going into post-Soviet generation of Russian engineers, <clears throat> highly competent in kind of ba basic stuff, hard sciences, like hardcore programmers, uh, very much <clears throat> also kind of willing to take risks and work work with um, startups and, and new ideas. So yeah, it's definitely the post-Soviet Russia-Ukraine engineers are a strong, um, strong group. Are yeah. legends in Web3. Yeah, legends. It, uh, it worked out for whatever reason. Awesome. Gleb, thank you for sitting down with us, getting into the intricacies of Cell Frame. If you're listening, and you want to get deeper with what these guys are building, we'll have links down here. Um, regardless, show them some love from the 100X Club. Appreciate you guys for listening. All right, Gleb, 100X. Thank you, thank again, you guys. Thank fantastic. you very much.